Hi, everyone. Welcome to another exciting edition of Words, Images, and Worlds. I am honored on this episode to be talking with a prolific author, someone who I believe, as we will explore, is connected to a, a television show that I watched as a child. Um, and probably lots of other listeners out there either currently watch or have watched as well. And that is author Sarah Alby. Sarah, thank you for jumping in and talking with me for a few minutes. Oh, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, that show, of course, that I was talking about was Sesame Street. You've written picture books in that world. And I believe you also worked on the television show. Is that right? Um, well, in adjacent roles, I did. Um, nice, nice. Everyone who arrives at, it used to be called Children's Television Workshop, would sort of show up thinking, all right, I'm ready to write for the show. But mm -hmm. I mean, I was a very junior person when I started out there. And I and when I left, I was a senior editor and I was doing all kinds. I was working with the music. I was doing a lot of audio recordings with the Muppets, which was super fun. I was mm -hmm. um, but mostly I was in the print division because I really I really am a print person at mm -hmm. heart. Um, mm -hmm. I love, love, love Sesame Street. I love the show. I love everything about it. But I, I realized that that was really my true calling was was the pr the printed word. I'm just a book person. So, yeah. but um, as a result, I, when I left there, when we had our second child and we moved out of New York city, I started freelancing for them a lot. And so I have a bazillion Sesame street books. Many of them are under a pseudonym, although oh, once yeah. in a while I'd forget and my real name would slip on. So, but yeah, it, it was, it was, a, they were, a, it was a wonderful place to work. You want it to be a fun place to work. It was such a fun place to work. Nice, nice. So good to hear. Good to hear that. And um, you said you are a book person. So I'm curious, how, how did that happen? How did you become a book person? Because I'm an English teacher and I am all about helping people become book people. So I'm curious about that. Well, I mean, I was the dorky little kid who read the encyclopedia and the world book, you know, the world book with those acetate pages of the human body. I would be fascinated <laughs> by those. And But I, I was just a, I was as so many authors are, um, I was a prolific reader and I read widely and indiscriminately <laughs> growing up. Um, so I, I guess, I guess when I got out of college, I really wanted to do something to do with writing or publishing and I wasn't sure what. So what did I do? I went off to Egypt <laughs> uh -huh. um, and I spent a year there. I spent a year living in Cairo, which was amazing and wonderful. And it was a great way to learn Arabic. And I ended up getting recruited to play on this women's basketball team while I was there. I didn't even know women played basketball. They do. They're, it's, it's a huge sport there. Um, but I, I had a job at the press office of the American University. And that was a real deep dive into learning the publishing business. And when I got back, I thought, oh, I want to do something in publishing. But I mean, it's still the case. The entry level publishing positions, you can barely pay your water bill, let alone rent in New York City. It was very so. Uh, but I found I just was really lucky and I just landed a job at Sesame Street and it was the perfect job for me. I, that was where I realized I wanted to write for kids. And it just embodied, embodied everything I love just humor, kids music, silliness, it just puppetry. I mean, it was just animation. I mean, just you name it. And the, the people who worked there were also incredible people. So Lovely. that's Lovely. my, that's my path. <laughs> Love it. Um, so the path has continued and I believe you have over a hundred books. Is that right? Something like that? Yeah. I mean, kids always ask me when I do school, visits, how many books have you written? So I sort right. of throw out 150, but I honestly haven't counted them um, recently because they often books will go out of print or they'll have be reissued with new covers. Or, I mean, I used to keep very careful track, but I've sort of stopped keeping track, but um, it's really after I, after I left Sesame Street and I was freelancing a lot and I wrote for Sesame Street and I wrote a lot of 
um, books for a lot of other shows like SpongeBob and Blue's Clues and Dora and all that. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. that was a fantastic living when I had three tiny children. And I was really, I mean, it was it was really fun. I was really good at it. I was really fast at it. And so I was able to make a good living and have three tiny children. But it was really when they got a little older that I pivoted. I hate that word. I just used it. Ah, I pivoted (laughs) to my real love, which is nonfiction. And and that's so I've been writing pretty exclusively nonfiction for about 15 years now. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. that's been a dream job too. I mean, it's, it's, it's just amazing that I can kind of just come up with whatever I want to write about. And I've finally gotten to the place now where I can more or less, not always, I mean, I, I don't sell every book I write, but I, I've been able to make a living as a nonfiction writer and it's been my dream job truly. Yeah. yeah. You you have a couple of uh, my favorites and ones that stand out to me on the shelf behind you, Poison, uh, um, troublemakers in trousers, um, and then also accidental archaeologist is also really really cool as well. Yeah, the accidental archaeologist and well that the three the three most recent books troublemakers came out last year, mm-hmm. and then just prior to that I have a book called Fairy Tale Science, mm-hmm. which believe it or not is nonfiction, and the premise of it is that I, I there are forty fairy tales, some of them very well known. Thank you, Disney. Mm-hmm. Um, some of them less well known to modern kids. So I do a little sort of snarky synopsis of a fairy tale. And then I pull out a scientific question, like, could a pair of glass slippers survive an evening of ballroom dancing? Or could Rapunzel's hair support the weight of a prince? And then you do experiments to test it out. And so there's tons and tons of science in it. And it was, that was super fun to do. Um, I really think Accidental Archaeologist is, I think, among my most favorite of books that I have out right now. It's mm-hmm. just, it, it's basically, the premise is basically ordinary people who stumble across major archaeological finds that change <laughs> what we thought we knew about history. Um, some of them very well known to grownups, you know, the Rosetta Stone and the Dead Sea Scrolls, and but some of them are much lesser known stories, and they're so cool. I just I just love to share them with kids. So. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a, a particular creative process that you go through and things that you keep in mind for your audience, uh, being that you write for young readers? Yeah, I mean, I I keep a lot of a notebook and a spark file and all and I and generating ideas has never been a problem for me. It's more. I have too many ideas and I don't know which one to tackle first. And the more I've done it, the better I've gotten at sort of gauging, is this a picture book idea? Is this a middle grade idea? Is this a longer form idea? And I'm not always right, but I'm better at it than I used to be. So, Mm -hmm. but honestly, nowadays I have, here I go. I'm going to use pivoted again. (laughs) I have pivoted (laughs) to, um, I'm not going to say ideate, I promise. No, but I have started <laughs> writing nonfiction picture books. My next three books, the ones that are in the pipeline and will be out in the next year and two years, are all picture books. And it's more or less the same audience, the sort of eight to 12 year olds that I love to write for. But I think post pandemic kids are really struggling, a lot of them, with mm-hmm. reading and comprehension. And I think the added help of lots and lots of visuals in telling a story is there's there's no downside to it and so I'm that's kind of what I've been doing and it's been really fun I mean it's kind of a learning curve because it's a different kind of picture books that I wrote for Sesame Street and other stuff it's you know nonfiction picture books are their own unique genre Um, but I'm blessed with having very good editors too and artists too yeah, I, I have pivoted to to use the word. I don't know if pirouette <laughs> is the word or I, I don't know. I like pirouette. That's good. Yep, yep. I'm going to use uh, that one. <laughs> all right. All right. Sounds good. Uh, I used to be the kind of reader when I was in school that if I saw a picture on a page, I would sort of skip over it, you know, and sort of read yeah, through it quickly. Yeah. And um, it was like, oh, there's not as much homework to do if there's like a large graph on the science page. But now I'm the kind of reader that 
I really dig into those things and I appreciate what they add to the page so much. And, um, you know, whether it's pictures like a, a pictorial narrative or um, a table or, or whatever it happens to be, I'm, I'm a big fan of the things that those add to the page. Yeah, I mean, they really do. Pictures really are a thousand words. And and kids these days, they're just assaulted by images online at all times, at all day long and on their phones. And so I think they're, they're probably more visual learners than we were, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, you know, it's not better or worse. It's just different. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, I was also going to hat tip your history books. You have an entire mm -hmm. run of, uh, if that's the right word for that, a run or series of sort of like historical biographies that uh, I know are also very useful for reading and for instruction too. Yeah, those are, um, it, I, I loved, I have loved doing those books. I have six biographies and they're, they're, not mass market, but they're they're in a series. They're in the I Can Read series with HarperCollins, which is a wildly successful series. And every publisher has a version of that. You know, Random House has Step Into Reading, and mm -hmm. I, I I'm spacing on what everyone else's is called. So it's a leveled reader, and it's has comes with very strict guidelines of how to write, how many words, you know, and like mm -hmm. where you can break a sentence or not break a sentence, and sort of controlled vocabulary, all that sort of thing. And yeah. that was, it was really helpful. My Sesame Street background, knowing how to tell a kind of complex story in a simple way, but not dumb it down for kids. And I love those books. Honestly, they take every bit as much research, if not more, even though they look like they don't. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that's it. a lot of the general public really probably and I don't blame them for not understanding that but I know you know I've had every writer has had someone say hey I've written a children's book will you read it and when they say children's book of course they mean a picture book because that's mm -hmm. kind of what everyone thinks of when they think children's book um but there are so many different levels and genres in the you know there's picture books there's leveled readers there's chapter books there's YA there's et cetera et cetera et cetera so, uh, graphic novels of course Mm -hmm. Um, so, but picture books are the ones that everyone knows and they think they look really easy and they're so not easy. Yeah. I, I have, yeah. I have worked so hard on so many picture books. So, I mean, I would say a lot of my longer books are a breeze compared to how much work <laughs> these picture <laughs> books can be. Yeah. But, yeah. Almost poetic, the like economy of yeah, words. Yeah, exactly, exactly yeah. right. You have to cut, 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 and just get to the core of the story. And that you have to really know what you want to say. And cool. sometimes that can take 15 or 35 drafts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm thinking about an elementary reading class that I took once where we looked at like the differences between some of those levels and it's so nuanced. And I imagine as the mm -hmm. writer, like you were talking about how long a sentence can be that can make a difference between right. one text level and another. So there's, there's exactly. a lot there. Yeah. And it helps, you know, I ha I've done a lot of different writing and I've done a lot of like journalistic writing where you have a certain word count and you mm -hmm. have to mm -hmm. nail it. You can't go on and on and on. And that's, all of it is really good training for, you know, for all of this kind of writing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, uh, I'm curious by means of a final official question, and we can, of course, also hit anything that we missed. Um, I know that you have a website, Sarah Alby Books, I believe is what it is. Yeah. Um, and so I want to make sure I mention that and I'll link it. Um, but any other web spaces that you want to share, as well as anything that's in the, the creative fire right now that you'd like to mention that's either in development or soon out? Yeah, thank you for asking. I have mm -hmm. actually three books um, that are in progress right now under contract being illustrated as we speak. One of them is actually finished. The, the one that's coming out next, which will be next September, um, I'm really excited about it. It's it's called The Painter and the President. 
Mm. And it's going to be illustrated, it is illustrated by the artist Stacy Innerst, who he is an incredible painter. He's, he's really a fine artist. And um, it's the story is about George Washington mm -hmm. and his go-to portrait painter, Gilbert Stewart, who most people have never heard of, but Gilbert Stuart, you, if you saw his portraits, you would know them in an instant. Mm -hmm. And so Gilbert Stuart was this, was the go-to guy in the late 1700s, early 1800s to paint portraits. And I, and Martha commissioned a portrait with Gilbert Stuart to paint George and they could not stand each other. And I, I, that was the part that I sort of stumbled across as I was reading a biography of George Washington. The, um, yeah, it was, it was the Ron Chernow biography. And there was just a little sentence in there like, oh yeah, they really didn't like each other. Like what? And that's usually, if I stop in my tracks and say, wait, what? I'm, I write that down because that could be a book idea. And sure enough, and because Gilbert Stewart was sort of, you know, this Liberty Jibbit, he was very, he made dumb puns and corny jokes and people could walk around the room and drink Madeira and chat with their friends. And, but he would nail you to the canvas in about two hours. Like he had this amazing knack of, he didn't mix paints on his palette. He just mixed them next to each other on the canvas. And he, oh, wow. he was a brilliant and every, no one could understand how he did it. Cause some of those, you know, John, Copley and Charles Wilson Peel and all the you know you'd have to sit there still as a statue for 16 sittings or however many that he would have and you didn't have to do that with Gilbert Stewart but George Washington was very you know he had a lot of gravitas and he believed that he should be treated with with gravitas mm -hmm. and so they they just kind of didn't hit it off but I think you can sort of see it in the three portraits Gilbert Stewart painted of George Washington. He's sort of <laughs> glowering at the canvas, out of the canvas. But what I love about this is that kids, it's relevant to kids because that painting that Gilbert Stewart, the last one that he did, well, actually the second to last, but whatever, the Athenaeum painting, um, which he left unfinished to Martha's deep, deep chagrin and annoyance. Um, but he, that is the painting that was used on the dollar bill. Oh, so wow, it's an yeah. etching on the dollar bill. So it's reversed because it's an etching. But so if kids read this book and then they can look at the dollar bill and I talk about his, how his teeth were bothering him and his mouth is all swollen. So you can actually see his swollen mouth on the dollar bill. It's amazing because Gilbert Stewart was nothing if not a realist. Like you see all the powdery dandruffy stuff on his shoulders and stuff. Mm. So anyway, I love, I just love kind of the stories behind the paintings. I love going, getting into that sort of thing. So, and then anyway, my, my other book, I promise not to go on and on and on with the other oh, two, but you, the you other. Are good. You are fine. <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> The other, the other two, one of them is, is going to be called Bounce, A Scientific History of Rubber. Mm -hmm. And it is the story of rubber, not just the narrow story that we always hear about the vulcanization of by Charles Goodyear. It's really like from Mesoamerica and when and when the Spanish invaders came and they were amazed by this these ball games, the Maya were, that were playing and the Aztecs and um they had never seen a ball bounce before. There was no word in the Spanish or English language that meant bounce. Ah. until 1600 or 1585 or whatever it is they were like oh it jumps off the ground and like they <laughs> had no word for bounce and so it's the story of of the discovery well the westernized discovery the old world discovery from the new world of of rubber and then the vulcanization process and then you know how all these inventions were made possible by vulcanized rubber, including automobiles and tires and the bicycle craze. And it's just, so it's a sweeping history as I always seem to do. Um, but it's, I think it's, again, I'm hoping kids will see the relevance of it because there's so much rubber in our lives and we can't live without it. And it's the sort of this, this unknown, like we all know that there are certain things that society cannot live without, but rubber is probably not in anyone's top 10 list, but it should be in their top five, truly. Because yeah. society would would just disintegrate without rubber. So, and then the third one, and <laughs> I am droning on, the third no, no, one is, good. <laughs> the third one is 
is about the number zero, the discovery of the number zero, which believe it or not, was unknown in the Western world. If you think about it until like the Crusades, I mean, if you think wow. about it, Roman numerals, there's no zero. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's so it screwed everything up. Like the whole Gregorian calendar, there's no, with no zero, they start with a year with the first century instead of the zeroth century. You know, that's why the 19th century is the 1800s. Everything's all messed up because there was no zero in the Roman calendar, but, that but it's sense. more than just that. And it sort of, and it was discovered by an, an Indian, um, an unknown Indian, somebody from India, um, probably in the 300 or 400 or 500 AD, we're not quite sure, um, but it made its way to the House of Wisdom in Baghdad and this brilliant mathematician, well, it was Brahma Gupta, who's this Indian guy, wrote a book about it. And then that book was translated into Arabic and this guy named, um, I'm going to mess up his name, but he wrote a book called Al-Jabra, da, 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 and that's where algebra comes from. Uh -huh. And then it was this the guy Fibonacci that we most of us have heard of who brought that book to Europe, but nobody paid any attention where it introduced zero to the Europeans, but nobody paid any attention because it was thought of as like dangerous Saracen magic because, uh -huh. you know, the Crusades are going on. So it's, it's incredible, like the politics behind this whole, I mean, it's a number of people <laughs> embrace it. It's a really good idea. And yeah. when they finally did, you know, Newton, like, oh yeah, calculus. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing. These, these little, well, they're not little, but things that we don't know about just are these incredible stories. So I, I love finding stuff like that. It's just really thrilling. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we take so much for granted in, in life and society. So uh, I yeah. love that you put a scope on all of those things. Well, thanks. Yeah, yeah. it's fun. <laughs> um, have we missed anything in the talk through that you want to make sure to mention in terms of resources, um, school visits, uh, anything like that, that you'd like to, to mention? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say whenever I go to schools and kids say, what's your favorite part of your job? I I say truthfully visiting schools. I mean, I, I it's one of the best parts of being a children's book author is visiting. I, and I visit schools all over the country and I do, you know, I talk to kindergartners and I talk to eighth graders and, and everyone in between. And it's nice to have books from all so many different age groups because I am able to, you know, sort of target the different age levels and, and mm -hmm. do an appropriate presentation but it really is and it's just it's just fun to to meet people in places you wouldn't go otherwise they're not like vacation destinations or anything but that's where real people live and teachers and librarians are my favorite people on earth so <laughs> it's just a really it's just my idea of like the funnest funnest thing to do is to visit schools so Awesome. Awesome. Well, well, thank you so much for the time, Sarah, and thank you for the work. I kind of feel like you're the the children's literature kind of explorer in the world of like Mary Roach and, uh, you know, those sort of books. Oh, that, well, that's, that... that's a big compliment. I, I'm a big fan of hers. So thank yeah. you for saying that. She's she's uh, she's terrific. I, I love her work. So and Likewise. it's just, you know, it's Likewise. fun to be funny. And, you know, a lot of stuff about history is not funny. So it's it's fun to find the lighter side that kids can kind of relate to and, and learn from too. So I agree. I agree. I totally agree. I'm uh, glad to talk to you anytime as more work and more questions are coming into place. And I know that you'll have them as you're reading and exploring. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Pleasure here as well. Thanks so much.